the, the level of precision and discipline and consistency that was expected of you day after day was unlike anything I'd ever have to, had to produce before. It was hard, man. It was, uh, it was a really neat experience, though. Flying Blue Angel number one, the commanding officer, flight leader of the Blue Angels from Nantucket, Massachusetts, Commander Ross Bartlett. Well, I was kind of uh, broke the tradition of my family because we were all Army in previous generations. Dad, uncle, granddad, everybody was in the United States Army. Uh, and I grew up out on Nantucket Island off the coast of Massachusetts. And when I was 11 years old, I had a 13-foot Boston Whaler, a little boat. And I'd be out on the boat every day all summer. And in winters, I'd be riding around on my little dirt bike around the island. And my mom kind of realized that I should not be a banker or something like that. I need to do something totally different. And so we started looking at the Naval Academy. I graduated in 1983. And uh, in fact, the end of your sophomore year, you can quit if you want, and there's no obligation if you want to go pursue a different, a, a different university. And so I called my folks and I said, hey, I'm leaving, I'm going to go be a professional motocross rider. And they were not amused and somehow they talked me off the ledge and I stayed. So I went down to flight school in Pensacola with all my buddies from the Naval Academy. That was a great year. Uh, after that, went to, uh, went to Beeville, Texas uh, for, for advanced, intermediate and advanced training and ended up going, uh, getting drafted to go fly S3s after that, which was not my first choice. So went out to the fleet and flying this four-seat airplane. I was a landing signal officer, so it's one of those guys who stands on the back of the ship, you know, and grades landing. So I'd go around to all the ready rooms to debrief. So I got a flavor of the Hornet community and all the other communities on the boat. And I was like, man, the Hornets, man, that thing is, that's where I need to be. And so somehow things worked out. Uh, did a good job in the S3. The Navy threw me a bone and said, okay, fine, you can transition to the Hornet. So in 1989, I went to the Hornet rag. Six months, I was away from my air wing, came back to the same air wing with different patches on my flight suit, and I was flying the Hornet. And the best part of it was, since all my buddies were on shore duty at that time, I got to go to Desert Storm. And so that was kind of the great equalizer. I got to get caught up in the Hornet uh, through, you know, six months or a few months of combat. Came back from, uh, my, from that Hornet squadron and went to the Hornet uh, training squadron, VFA 106, and uh, did a tour as an instructor pilot there. Then it was time for me to go to my department head tour. I volunteered to go to Japan. So we went over there for, three, for two years. Came back to the War College, uh, did CNO Strategic Studies Group, went and did a uh, disassociated tour with the Joint Special Operations Command uh, down at Fort Bragg. And that was kind of a life changer. It makes you watch the news differently when you work with the Special Ops guys. It was amazing, super cool. Uh, and then went back to Japan and volunteered to go again for my command tour. While I was there, uh, Blood Driscoll was my deputy air wing commander, and uh, you know I had thought about the blues a bit, but didn't think I was really in the right spot for it. And he's just like, put the package in and see what happens. So we did, got to go to the finalists. Six guys came to Corpus Christi for the finalist interviews. And I told my wife before I left Japan, there was two guys in the United States Navy that I hoped would not be finalists with me, because they were the right guys for the job. They were both finalists with me. So that it all worked out. So my first flight in a blue jet was with Max McCoy in the slot. I didn't really know what to expect, but it surprised me because as soon as we rotated, you know, it's just like, yeah, it's, you know, there's just tires right there going, you know, right across the canopy. We tuck into the slot and up we go for the loop. And I was like, wow, this is unbelievable. The one that really blew my mind was double Farville. So we're inverted over boss and Max is just chatting away about we're approaching the main gate of Pen NES Pensacola at 100 feet, 390 knots, you know, like this. And Max is talking, oh, he's right over there. I was fishing with my son last night. You know, we caught some bass and it was, oh, it was awesome. It was such a beautiful night. I was like, Max, shut it. I am not interested in your fishing at this particular moment. <laughs> but he was comfortable, second year guy, you know, he's just doing his thing. Todd Abrahamson, Jack, was uh, the right wingman and it was his job to train me, <laughs> which was unfortunate for him. It's a hard job and uh, it's a job he's never done. So it was a really interesting and cool dynamic. We got to be really good with each other, but it was a tough few months figuring it out. You know, I couldn't find Center Point out in El Centro to save my life. It's just sand in desert. Uh, but uh, Todd, Todd kept beating me up and we'd just go through the debriefs and be humble and roger that, learn. It's something I'd never done before. It's harder than anything I'd ever done before in the airplane. You know, I've been flying it for 18 years. You know, 841 traps. Thought I'd been around the block a few times, but this was completely different and it was hard. The first non-El Centro show was at Punta Gorda in Florida. And I had my, whole, well, my mom and dad 
my siblings, they're all there. And I just remember Saturday morning, they want to have breakfast at the hotel. This is my first show, not in El Centro. So, you know, we're sitting down there breakfast and it's like, I can't do this, you know? I had to go back upstairs and get my satellite photo out and walk around my, you know, my hotel room doing the routine over and over and over. Go out for a run. If I could still recite it and remember the checkpoints, okay, I got it. You know, and if I couldn't, oh my God, come back to the room and review them. So that, that was my first Saturday morning before a show and uh, it was tough. So sorry, mom and dad, I'll catch you, catch you on Sunday afternoon. Certainly there's a level of familiarity. I thought especially second season going through El Centro again was getting like it to repeat your senior year in high school. So it was kind of neat to, to focus on different things out in the desert. You know, focus on tightening up my own parameters and my own performance and giving the wingman, uh, you know, a, a stable platform to train on. So that was super fun and a great opportunity to go to school again, you know, and then take that out to the second season. Second season was much more enjoyable. You got to see a lot more things, engage a lot more with with folks at social events. At the first year, I was really trying to get through my talk, you know, get through uh, the introduction of the team and not forget anyone's hometown, that kind of stuff. Second year is a lot easier. We had really a great honor of having Discovery Channel film us for a year in the life during the 2004 season. And one of the scenes that people who watch the documentary challenge us on is when we were in Traverse City. Because we've been on a long show, we are up in Alaska and you know, been on the road for a couple of weeks. And on Friday morning in Traverse City, a bunch of us went to the laundromat to wash our flight suits and stuff. And people are like, you didn't go to the laundromat and wash your own flight suits and skibbies and all that, did you? Well, yeah, if you want some clean clothes. So that was kind of, that was kind of memorable. Traverse City was awesome. Seattle was just a beautiful show. Also, the guy said, oh, they, get you, they have a Corvette. And I was like, you wouldn't have a Corvette. And I said, when you pull into the chocks, there's a Corvette in front of the chocks, and it's got a Seafair One license plate on it, and it's yours for the weekend. And I was like, come on. Sure enough, we come around the corner, and there's seven, six Corvettes that were lined up in front of our parking spaces. That was pretty cool, except for Saturday morning, Doc and I went out to get coffee, and I got a ticket right in front of the Chevy dealer. You know, so <laughs> Chevy guys, get out of here. You don't give him a ticket right in front of this place. I think probably the toughest one by far was Chicago. And I guess that's why that's a second year only boss show. We alternate that with the Thunderbirds. Because the buildings are 1,100 feet tall and you're flying these patterns behind the crowd six, 700 feet, you know, with six airplanes sometimes. So, and it's windy and the wind come, comes through those buildings uh, and it's just violent. So it was a hard show site, but uh, it was super fun. And I remember doing the double farble going over Navy Pier and go, oh man, I had, lunch with my son there yesterday. That was so cool. And I was like, wait, Max McCoy you know, was talking about fishing with us. Shut up, fly the profile, you know. We had the Snowbirds down to Pensacola and they flew a nine plane demo and they had side by side seating. So each of us got to fly with our counterparts in their demo. But Snowbirds boss goes, hey, let's, uh, let's smoke the beach. And I was like, we didn't talk to anybody about that. We just can't take a nine plane up and down Pensacola beach. He's like, ah, I'm Canadian. What are they gonna do? And so. I'm like, oh boy. So we, sure enough, depart, you know, drive 20 miles up Pensacola Beach with a smoke on with a nine ship of snowbirds, turn around, come back and come in for the break. And I was like, oh, I'm gonna hear about that. But the takeaway for me was they do a nine plane line of rest maneuver. My son, Alex, of course, is watching there, my, my biggest air show critic. And he's like, dad, these guys fly a nine plane line of rest loop and you're always crying about your five plane line of rest maneuver. It doesn't look like it's all that hard. <laughs> so, it's like, wow, son, thanks. Thanks for the feedback. It's Hurricane Ivan closing in with frightening intensity tonight. We were up in Halifax. We just finished the Halifax show and we were getting ready to transit town to Nantucket. And that was my home show. And I had 55 friends and family coming out to the island for the weekend. Ivan hit Wednesday, Wednesday afternoon, Wednesday evening. Uh, we just watched the Weather Channel before we left. We flew to Nantucket watching it that night and it's just like wow this is really bad and it came ashore as a cat four and so you know i was talking to the master chief back home and we had people who everyone hover backed my wife two kids and the dog were at the holiday inn in memphis with a lot of our, our other blue angel families and so everyone just scattered from the southeast united states so we canceled saturday night at seven or uh, saturday morning at 7 30 in the morning all my friends and family are out at the airport and we're like sorry and we took off and flew back to Pensacola. 
And from Atlanta on, there was no one to talk to, you know, because there's no power down there. So Atlanta Center just said, hey, good luck. It was daytime, good weather. So we came back to Pensacola, didn't talk to anybody, circled the field in Delta, uh, and did the turnout to land. It's crazy. That was a big setback, though, because we lost two weeks of flying, you know, getting everything reset. And then we met back in El Centro two weeks later and picked up the season with Salinas. Having Bert was amazing from a logistics point of view, clearly, because uh, it gave us so much flexibility. And especially when we're at a site and we had a problem, we need to go get an engine or you know something that would have been really hard without Bert. So that was amazing. But the best part of it was we had Jado back in, in our time. And it was so funny to go to the crowd line and you see some little kid there and you're talking to him and you go, hey man, what was the best part of the show? Fat Albert. I was like, wow, I worked really hard for 35 minutes, but the crowd loved Bert, especially with Jado. That was the remarkable thing about the tour that was also so different from being in the fleet. You placed your complete trust in the maintenance team to prep the jet. I didn't even pre-flight the jet. You know, I went out strapped in and four minutes and four seconds later, we're taxiing out because I trusted my crew chief implicitly to make sure everything was right and set up perfectly. And they just created miracles, you know, every night. The planes were old. They're the oldest Hornets in the fleet and they break. And those guys were just guys and gals who make magic happen every night and come out in the morning and there's six jets on the flight line. Just go, wow. Consecutive miracles, night after night. Amazing. It was the greatest honor of my professional military career to be selected to do that job. Being a part of this organization after you've left the team is when you really realize, it, when, you're, when you're on the team, you're so busy and you're hair on fire and you just try to learn the demo, manage the schedule and get through it, you know, and put on a good air show demonstration. When you leave is when you get to look back and go, holy cow, I've never been closer, more trusting of six other aviators in my entire life. And uh, that's pretty special. And being part of this whole thing and hanging out with the alumni, this small club of people who have had this job and done this is really, really neat. And the thing I take away from it the most, and I, I told the noobs when they came in uh, during the fall of 2004, is that people remember the blue suit and they remember that they talked to a blue angel at the crowd line or met him you know, at Starbucks away, you know, before the show, whatever it is. And, you know, it's my assessment that they remember the blue suit more than Russ Bartlett. But the thing about the suit, it was so powerful. You know, it's just a, a great icebreaker and a way to, to be able to have access to kids of all socioeconomic uh, and backgrounds, things like that. That tour was magical because you could share something that was immense, and that was your time and a special experience. Just a great way to make an impact.